Okay, well, thank you for having come back. Um, I'm going to talk now about population genetics more specifically and developments in population genetics. <coughs> but just to remind you that I made this distinction between Darwinism and Neo-Darwinism. Neo-Darwinism included Mendelian inheritance. And Neo-Darwinism became the established view of evolution and to a large extent still is. Um, and population genetics was an important part of that, particularly the theoretical developments by Fisher and Wright and Haldane. But population genetics, the, 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 the contribution to the, of population <coughs> genetics to neo-Darwinism was to establish the plausibility of the mechanism. That is, natural selection acting on Mendelian variants could account for evolution. And it was very much of a theoretical argument, a plausibility argument. There was a great deal that was not known about population genetics in the, in the first part of the 20th century. So I mean, much of the development was theoretical for the simple reason that there was almost no data to analyze. So there was this general agreement that Mendelism and evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution, were compatible, but there was no specific knowledge about exactly how Mendelism contributed to variation, exactly the details that you would like to know. There were no specifics of population genetics. And so the, the 20th century is largely from our point of view, is largely a story of the, how population genetics went from this abstract and general subject to a very specific subject uh, concerned with details that we now have great access to. <coughs> Oops. So just to emphasize, okay, just to emphasize what was not known, despite the contribution of population genetics, is very simple things. How many genes were in the genome? Not really a population genetic question, but obviously related to it what fraction of the genes are polymorphic? That is, what fraction carried two or more Mendelian alleles, and what fraction were fixed for only one allele? How many alleles per polymorphic gene? If there were, were there two or were there 25? People didn't know. What were typical differences between, in genotype between members of the same species? You know, we'd look, we, we could look at any species just the way Darwin did and see that there was abundant variation at the phenotypic level, at the level you could see. What was the genetic basis for those differences? Was it a few Mendelian genes? Were it a lot of Mendelian genes? How did those genes affect variation? Whoops, well, what are we doing here? Same question you can ask. What, what fraction of genes are polymorphic? Well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> what are the differences in genotype between members of, this, of different species? So we can see, just as we can look at differences within a species, you can look at differences, say, between humans and chimpanzees, or between one species of plant and another. How many genes account for those differences? We had no idea. People had no idea at the at the time. They knew there was Mendelian inheritance, they believed in the multifactorial theory, and they believed that Mendelian genes were the basis for inheritance. They believed that natural selection acting on Mendelian genes could change allele frequencies, 
And that was consistent with the pattern of evolution. But that was it. And furthermore, even if we, with the pattern, there's the pattern of variation, people also did not know what maintained variation. Thanks to Wright and Fisher and others, we knew that genetic drift would cause alleles to be lost. And thanks to Haldane and Fisher in particular, we knew that natural selection could act to either maintain genetic variation through what's called balancing selection. That is somehow, for some reason, heterozygotes are better than homozygotes. <coughs> uh, but we did, so we, we had mechanisms, population genetic mechanisms could eliminate variation, population genetic mechanisms could maintain variation. But what was actually maintaining variation, we didn't know. We knew mutation had to ultimately be the source of all new variants. But is the availability of mutation limiting in evolution? You could imagine a thought experiment where you would turn off mutation, that suddenly no more new mutations would appear. Would evolution immediately grind to a halt? Or would evolution proceed for a very long time acting on existing genetic variation already present in a species? We can't do that experiment, but we could ask that question and imagine what the answers would look like. People had no idea. And what forces maintain phenotypic variation? And do, does genetic variation, do differences between species, are they the result of natural selection or are they the result of some other forces, including genetic drift? or forces that we don't yet know about. So there was a lot not known, despite the agreement about the importance of population genetics. Now in the first part of the, the first half of the 20th century, there were several ways to study genetic variation. I mean, people didn't sit around and say, oh, well, let's wait till DNA sequencing was developed, is developed so we can really find out what's going on. They did the best they could with, with the information they had. <coughs> in one way or another, all studies of variation involve visible mutants or visible differences. And so uh, the Morgan and others studied, uh, the, created the foundations of genetics largely by studying uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly. And in this species, it, it, they, by the way, they did it not because it, they knew it was such a great study organism, but because it was cheap. This was before NIH. They could grow Drosophila bottles, uh, Dr uh, Drosophila in milk bottles, where they pushed bananas in the bottom, and the flies they could keep flies alive. And then, when they really had no money, they would take the milk bottles to the doorstep where milkmen left clean bottles, where the clean bottles were, and swapped out the dirty ones. And for the younger people here, milk bottles are glass containers <laughs> that used to that milk used to be delivered in. Um, so, and, but it turned out Drosophila was very nice because it was, you, you could grow lots of them in each of these milk bottles. And there were many mutants, once they looked, started looking closely, that um, were visibly different. So a short wing, these are just four of hundreds and hundreds of mutants, curly winged. So with a little practice and some ad, uh, agility with forceps, you could sort through flies and say, ah, here's a different one. And then you could see if it bred true, do various crosses. This allowed Morgan to discover re uh, linkage, genetic linkage, and, and uh, prove the chromosomal theory, that is, genes were inherit, were physically located on chromosomes. Chromosomes were known before, genes were known before, but it took some effort to prove that genes were on chromosomes. So, so visible mutants were very important. And visible mutants were studied in natural populations to st some extent. The trouble is it was very, very difficult to say, well, what effect on survival and reproduction these various forms had. Sometimes you could guess that defective wings, could, individual, defective wings would cause flies not to fly so well. But that's about as far as it went. So one, one tradition in studying variation was visible mutants. Second tradition came in, in human genetics, uh, starting with this paper in 1902. Garrod uh, recognized that a, a, a rare but known disease called Olcaptonuria 
a condition where if an individual has this, it's a, it's a metabolic defect. Uh, and it, the, one of the phenotypic symptoms is that a person's urine turns brown or even black when exposed to sunlight. Um, and it, as they say, ran in families, but he proposed it was specifically a Mendelian recessive and verified this with various family trees. And then he found uh, evidence that various other, what he called inborn errors in metabolism were also Mendelian recessive. Fetal, pheno, phenolketonuria is, is the, the most prominent of these, but there are many others. So in human genetics, Mendel Mendelian traits were known and people started examining Mendelism uh, in uh, Mendelian inheritance in humans, but, but largely for a clinical, not, a, not a, an evolutionary reason. <coughs> Nevertheless, they were studying variation in, in natural populations. A, a more prominent and probably the best known uh, line of research during this period was what we call ecological genetics. And e ecological genetics is based on the study of polymorph phenotypic polymorphisms. So a species that has two or more distinct forms that are easily recognizable and inherited sometimes as a single Mendelian trait or sometimes as a simple combination of two or three Mendelian traits. Um, and with these visible polymorphisms, the goal of ecological genetics was to discover how natural selection affected them. And the classic case, and one that everyone who teaches evolutionary biology, including me, inflicts on students, is the case of the peppered moth, which has a polymorphism. There's the melanic form, and there's the, the wild type or normal form. And as most of you probably know, the melanic form is at a disadvantage on normal trees because they're visible in birds. And it, it, the, Kettlewell and others established that birds actually do eat them with greater frequency. So they established the mechanism of natural selection, not just saying it occurred, but saying, here's the agent, the birds eat the dark ones. But then in, uh, in central uh, England, the trees became black because of pollution uh, from industrialization. And at that point, the light form was at a disadvantage. And indeed, the, the, this species was predominantly the melanic form in areas affected by industrial pollution. And Kettlewell and uh, his, his students uh, showed in great detail exactly how natural selection worked. And then people have continued this. But eco ecological genetics was pursued in many, many other organisms because you could do it. You could often do some in simple inheritance experiments, establishing a Mendelian basis for the trait. And you could do experiments in nature looking at how different forms were affected by ecological conditions, including visible predators or climatic conditions, particularly for plants or interactions with pollinators or something else. I mean, there were, there were ecological factors that you could study that you could demonstrate were the agents of natural selection. So ecological genetics was important in, in convincing people that there were practical examples of natural selection going on in nature, not just in, in the laboratory. And finally, and, and I would say almost equally important for historical reasons, another visible mutant was the distinct form that chromosomes had, what, what is called the karyotype. The karyotype is the collection, the morphology of all the chromosomes stained in a certain way and then viewed under a light microscope. And here's an example. This is uh, one chromosome from Drosophila. This is one of Dobzhansky's early papers. And Dobzhansky was one of the leading practitioners of this. Um, it happens, even almost a, uh, an amazing accident, it happens that chromosomes in Drosophila are very easy to study. They, in the salivary glands, they, they multiply in numbers so that when looked at under a light microscope, they're quite visible. So I mean, uh, technically, it's an easy trait. It didn't have to be this way. I mean, it could, it could be other species, but it happened to be the very species that that Morgan and others developed genetics with. Here is an example. Here is a, a 
a heterozygote for an inversion. Because of the way DNA pairs, if there is an inversion, that is, if there's a section that is just turned backwards, then when the chromosomes pair, they form a loop. And so you, this is a, uh, a heterozygote, between, heterozygote between two named inversions, sonoita and arrowhead. And there are many that are recognized in uh, Drosophila. And so these are morphological traits that could be studied, not quite with the naked eye, but fairly simply by looking at the salivary glands under a light microscope. And so you could look at the genotype directly. Remember, everything else was looking at the phenotype. You're looking at the genotype directly, not gene by gene, but at least chromosome by chromosome. And Dobzhansky, in particular, uh, a Russian geneticist who moved to the United States in the 1930s or 1920s, uh, spent his career studying inversion polymorphisms. And here's a slide from one of his later papers showing this is the frequency of the one of the, the Soniota uh, inversion type, that is the ST, yeah, the ST chromosomes in different places in the western United States where the Drosophila pseudobscura occurs and at different times because he had resampled many of these areas. And he showed that there was abundant variation in space and time. He also showed that these inversion polymorphisms were relatively common. They were not, these were not rare, obviously defective traits. They were, they were common enough to uh, to have moderate frequencies, and the frequencies varied in space and time in a ways that he 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 uh, characterized in great detail for years and years of of uh, field studies, and so his conclusion uh, was that these inversion polymorphisms were affected by natural selection, and in particular by balancing selection. That is, there was something very good about heterozygotes that caused selection to not be able to eliminate any of the types. Now, Dobzhansky, in addition to being an, an eminent geneticist, uh, one of Morgan's later students, <coughs> also was a very uh, charismatic and articulate proponent of neo-Darwinism. So he became one of the leaders in the neo-Darwinian synthesis. He's the one credited He's the one who, who first said, nothing in, in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Something well worth keeping in mind today. So his prominence and his, his forcefulness of character caused balancing selection to become a, a, a and possibly the major mechanism for maintaining genetic variation. So even though he discovered this only in, in Drosophila pseudo-obscura and a few other species, and he had, he had using chromosomal variation, his views on the role of natural selection became central to, to uh, the neo-Darwinian theory. <coughs> the alternative theory for maintaining variation is some version of mutation selection balance where you have mutations creating rare Mendel alleles and then natural selection eliminating them if they are deleterious or substituting them and driving them to fixation if they are advantageous. But mutation selection balance does not tend to maintain alleles in moderate frequency. Mutation rates are very low empirically and people found that they were very low. And so even weak natural selection causes deleterious alleles to be in low frequency. This is something Haldane and others established. Okay, so this was the state of things until the 1950s because there was no direct way to observe the genotype of individual loci. You could only look at the genotype of whole chromosomes. In the 1950s, biochemistry developed to the point that people could start to look at individual amino acids. This was the first paper in 1956, which showed that the difference between the sickle cell gene that was known to cause a trait sickle cell anemia that's common, especially in malarial regions in Africa and Asia, 
was attributable to a single amino acid change in the, in the beta hemoglobin molecule. So it was, and this, was, this had a profound effect. People talked about molecular diseases because a single amino acid change in a molecule led to a recognizable clinical <coughs> deleterious condition. And then amino acid sequencing developed very rapidly and Zucker, Kandel, and Pauling in the early 1960s. This isn't the, the first paper, the first molecular clock paper, but it's the one I had on my disk. And they recognized very quickly that comparing amino acid sequencing sequences of different species could tell you something about their evolutionary history. And because differences between species would accumulate only after those species had separated from a common ancestor. And they introduced in the early 1960s the notion of a molecular clock. That is, proteins accumulated amino acid differences roughly in proportion to the time that those two species are separated. The pro profoundly important discovery that they, they made and other people, they did it with globin molecules and then Margoliesh did it with cytochrome C and then everybody sequenced everything and, and largely verified the molecular clock hypothesis. Now different proteins had different clock rates, so the accumulation of amino acid differences took place at different rates. But for a particular protein, the rate was roughly constant in time. Very important development in population genetics. The next important development came in 1966 with the introduction of a, pro a method called protein electrophoresis. And the idea is very simple that you take an organism or uh, you take an organism and stain for a particular protein using methods that were already known at that time. Then you put the protein on the gel or put the extract from the individual stained on a gel and then you apply an electric current from through the gel from positive to negative or negative to positive depending on the protein. And then the gel is very viscous, and the distance the, the protein moves in a standard period of time indicates something about both its electric charge and its spatial conformation. So if it's long and skinny, it will move more slowly. If it's, if it's all compact, it will move more quickly in the same time. So gel electrophoresis had been used already in molecular biology many times. What two different groups did, Harry Harris in London with human proteins and Hubby in Lewinton at the University of Chicago did was show that if you look very carefully, the distance moved on a gel differs among individuals. And furthermore, that these differences were consistent if you're running under standard conditions. And sometimes you can see a heterozygote where there are two bands here Sometimes you see a homo or a heterozygote here where there are two bands. Sometimes you see only one band and you interpret this as a homozygote and then you do the breeding experiment to verify that the bands are inherited exactly as Mendelian alleles. So this was revolutionary because it allowed biologists for the first time to look at the genotypes of individual loci in a way that was both fairly cheap and fairly easy. It was something, once you got the basic idea, you could even build your own gel boxes. You didn't need huge grants to do this. And all you needed, all you were limited by was your, your ingenuity in staining proteins. And there were hundreds of protein stains uh, available. So suddenly you could look not just at one locus or two loci, but you could look at lots and lots of loci because there were lots of soluble proteins. There were lots of components of organisms that were not soluble and could not be studied this way. But still, it was a large number. It was a lot more than zero, which was where they were before. Now, when Le Hubby and Lewinton looked at this and Harris, Le Harris, Le Harris looked at this for several different proteins, what they found was that roughly 30% of the proteins they could study this way were polymorphic. 
that they had two, at least two alleles. And some had many more than two alleles. Some had six or eight different alleles segregating in a single population or between populations. So they started to answer some of the questions that I posed at the beginning. Secondly, they found that these alleles were in moderate frequencies. Many of them were not very rare in populations, but in frequencies 20, 30, 40 percent. Again, like Dobzhansky's uh, inversion polymorphisms. Now, this, when these papers were published, this led to an explosion first in empirical studies, because you could, everybody could do protein electrophoresis, and within 15 years, literally thousands of species had been surveyed by this means. And it also led to an explosion in population genetics theory, trying to explain why there was so much variation, why so many loci were polymorphic, why allele frequencies were so high. The mutation selection balance theory did not seem like a very convincing explanation because the alleles were too common. That would seem to point to the balance, balancing selection explanation. But that had problems also because there were so many loci. If you extrapolate, saying 30% of the loci, they didn't know how many loci there were, but they knew there were thousands. So we're talking about thousands of loci that are polymorphic. If each one is maintaining variation because there's balancing selection favoring heterozygotes, then a little bit of calculation that I won't present will tell you there has to be a huge variation in uh, relative fitness in the population that many individuals should drop dead because they happen to get a bad genetic draw. And many individuals should be super fit because they happen to get a good variant draw. I mean, technically, it's the variance in fitness was too large. As, the, as people said, the genetic load was too large created by balancing selection at so many loci. And so population geneticists Many people were brought into the field, attracted to the field, because of the excitement generated by these data, me included. That's when I entered the field. Now, in 1968, Kimura presented a third explanation, saying, no, look, it's not mutation selection. It's not balancing selection. Most of the variation we see is neutral, that these Poly these loci are polymorphic all right, but they are neutral. They are not affected by natural selection. And so then there's no problem. There's no genetic load problem. There's no problem at all. You just have mutation creating new alleles and then genetic drift slowly eliminating them. And Kimura and Crow had shown that the heterozygosity under certain assumptions is proportional to the product of the effective population size times the mutation rate. The mutation rate was known to be small. And so the prediction of the neutral theory is that there should be a huge range in heterozygosities. Because ecological, ecologists tell us some populations are very small. Some populations have millions and billions of individuals. So heterozygosity should range from almost zero to almost one. Fine. Well, the problem is that turned out empirically not to be true. Here is a, review, a figure from a review article by Eviatar Navo summarizing studies from 1,111 electrophoretic surveys of all different kinds of organisms. And what you can see here is the heterozygosity. This is the average difference in genotype between two individuals in the same species, or, or between two chromosomes from the same species which is to say every individual is heterozygous at some fraction of the loci. And you can see there is an upper limit here. No species has a heterozygosity of more than 30%. And furthermore, within uh, vertebrates tended to be slightly more, slightly less heterozygous than invertebrates, and slightly less heterozygous than plants. But there, was, there seemed to be almost no correlation between apparent population size and the heterozygosity. And there were no species that had the very high heterozygosities that you would expect to see 
if the neutral theory were literally true. So this Richard Lewinton called the paradox of variation. One resolution uh, Kimura's colleague Tomoko Ota proposed is that, well, new, we, things aren't exactly neutral. The selection coefficient is not zero. It's simply very small. So when new mutations appear, they are very weakly selected, and the importance of selection depends on the product of the population size and the selection coefficient. In very, very big populations, smaller selection coefficients come into play because this number becomes greater than one, and that limits the heterozygosity. Now, that's a nice explanation, but the other thing Kimura explained is the molecular clock. The neutral theory explains the molecular clock, that you get a constant rate of substitution in neutral alleles. This nearly neutral theory of OTA doesn't have that property, so you have all the molecular clock results inconsistent with the predictions of the nearly neutral theory. Okay, as I say, it led to an explosion of population genetics theory. One very notable development is the Ewan sampling formula, which is the sampling, he derived the sampling distribution of neutral alleles in a finite population. This was both an, an extremely elegant result. It also uh, showed that there was a much greater mathematical depth to population genetics than had previously been appreciated. And this also, Ewan's work also drew some very high level mathematicians into the field, people like John Kingman, Bob Griffiths and others, who uh, raised the stakes of, of mathematical theory and population genetics. Now, <coughs> DNA sequencing was discovered, was developed in the 1970s and applied in the 1980s to the point that people could start looking at the rate of DNA evolution and test the molecular uh, clock hypothesis in some detail. And this was a compilation by Wen Chung Li and others in 1985. They confirmed the neutral theory, that is the rate of substitution of nucleotides that do not change an amino acid is roughly constant for different kinds of proteins. The rate of non-synonymous substitutions, that is the substitution that changes the amino acid, varies hugely from protein to protein, confirming and, and reinforcing the zucker candle and Pauling hypothesis. Now, DNA, was, DNA sequencing was too difficult initially to be applied uh, to very many uh, species to look at within species variation. Uh, Marty Kreitman published a notable study in 1983 where he worked like a slave for years to sequence 11 individuals of Drosophila melanogaster. But the de real development of within population sequencing occurred with the, the, uh, the sequencing done of mitochondrial genome. Mitochondrial genome is a circular, mitochondrial are organelles, cell organelles that each has a little bit of DNA in a circle, about 16,000 base pairs. This was very easy to sequence for technical reasons, and it also was much more variable at the sequence level than, at least parts of it were variable at the sequence level than the corresponding amount of nuclear chromosome. So the same amount of work would get you 10 times as much polymorphism, roughly speaking. The sequencing of mitochondrial DNA took off in the 1980s with the development of the polymerase chain reaction. And one of the, uh, one of the first discoveries was made by, important discoveries was made by Alan Wilson, uh, late Alan Wilson uh, at Berkeley at the time. And what he showed, oh, the other thing about mitochondrial DNA, in case you don't know it, mitochondrial DNA is transmitted from mother to offspring. So there's no recombination your, your, your mitochondrial genotype is your mother's mitochondrial genotype plus any mutations. And her genotype was her mother's genotype, and so on, back in time. Necessarily, mitochondrial DNA 
has a history that's described by a tree. Necessarily, because you go back in time, eventually you'll, it's a pure death process, you go back to a single common ancestor. This also brought in phylogenetic thinking into population genetics for the first time. Because now things were not necessarily described in allele frequencies, they were described in terms of trees. What Wilson presented was, and his collaborators presented, was a, mitochondri a tree of mitochondrial DNAs from different humans, which went to, back to a common ancestor necessarily. They, they named this the mitochondrial Eve. And they estimated that it lived about 150,000 years ago. That is, there was a female alive who carried the ancestral of all mitochondrial DNAs in modern humans. Furthermore, the structure of the tree indicated by these black dots tells us that the ancestor probably lived in Africa rather than someplace else. This was the out of Africa hypothesis, which uh, profoundly changed our view of the history of modern humans, that all modern humans descended from a population in Africa roughly 150,000 years ago and not a population, not Homo erectus, which lived in other parts of, in Eurasia long before that, over a million years ago. Now, many people misunderstood this result and said, well, mitochondrial Eve is the ancestor of all modern humans. And that's definitely not true. And it's a misconception that still persists this individual carried the ancestor of all mitochondrial DNAs, but the ancestors of nuclear chromosomes were in somebody else, probably. There was a population of individuals, and all of them collectively were the ancestors of all the modern genome. It's only the mitochondrial DNA that has this, and the Y chromosome has a similar structure for males. Okay, then things developed very quickly. In the 1990s, there were lots of sequences of individual genes. PCR, preliminary train reaction, made this possible. Um, but the pace picked up with the establishment of the Human Genome Project and the tools developed for the sequencing of the human genome. Because once you develop the this, this sequence of one individual, once you find the sequence of one individual from a species, you have a reference genome, and then after that additional sequencing becomes very easy. So still, uh, species for which there is a reference genome are much, much more studied at the DNA sequence level than individuals, the species for which there is no reference genome. Now, the problems still persist, though. This is a, this is a slide from a paper by Molly Shaworski showing that the paradox of heterozygosity is not resolved with DNA sequencing. This is, these are heterozygosities, which is, it's called diversity here, from a large number of different organisms for which good sequences are available for a sufficient part of the genome. There is still a restricted range. There is still no clear correlation between effective population size and, and diversity, heterozygosity. So all of the new techniques we've, that we have available haven't really Conf uh, helped that much. We simply have a better version of the paradox we have. Now, but sequencing has been extremely successful, and particularly in historical reconstruction. That is, understanding the history of species and the geography of species in great detail. One of the mod notable discoveries is by this is, um, Sohini Ramachandran and others at Stanford, showing that there is a clear gradient in heterozygosity in human populations as the distance from Africa increases. It's not a, the, the slope isn't, it's not very steep, but there is a definite consistent pic, picture, and it can be, be matched by simulations which show that an out of Africa population going through a series of bottlenecks as the colonization of the rest of the world takes place can produce a gradient in heterozygosity that matches the, the observations. So patterns in variation at a global level within humans and other species can be accounted for by historical processes. You actually see similar patterns in Drosophila and melanogaster, which is a commensal with humans. That is, it lives in fruit stores. <laughs> 
And even if you look in detail, this is John Novembre, if you look in great detail at genetic variation within Europe, you can, with a principal components diagram, match the geography, the, the geographic similarity with the genetic similarity of individuals. That is, even in an area as well mixed as Europe, there's a close correspondence between geography and genetic proximity. And we've learned more um, about the history of population sizes. This is Lee and Dur a Lee and Durbin graph showing the history of population sizes of various human populations, and then Neanderthal and Denisova populations which join the rest of the group. So again, we've learned a lot about the history of individual groups. And we know quite a bit about the relationship between Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans and genetic exchange between them, all through the development and application of modern sequencing methods. Nevertheless, there's a great deal we don't know. We have now a very good answer to what are the patterns of change at the DNA sequence level in great detail. We have sequence, there are lots and lots of sequence data and more every, every hour. But we don't have good ver answers to any of these questions. We don't really know what maintains variation within a species. We know what the patterns of variation are, but we still don't know how important selection is. Rasmus Nielsen will tell you a lot about what we do know about selection, but the broad answers are still not available. We don't know for differences between species, how much the phenotypic differences arise from differences at the sequence level, or to reverse that, how the differences at the sequence level appear at the phenotypic level. We don't know how limiting mutation is. We don't know how important genetic drift and other factors are in accounting for phenotypic evolution. We know drift is very important at the sequence level. So, I, I, I will finish, conclude with this just to say we know a great deal, and we know a lot about the history of organisms, but in many ways we're not any closer to answering the fundamental questions about the genetic basis of evolution. And we should be somewhat humble uh, as, as a result. So thank you. The fraction of genes that are polymorphic? Well, we know the degree of polymorphism at the, at the DNA sequence level within genes, between genes, coding differences, non coding differences. I mean, like, I guess everything is polymorphic? Well, there, I, mean, it, I mean, there are different levels of heterozygosity, as that diagram showed. Uh, there are some genes that are almost not at all polymorphic in coding differences. Some genes that have a lot of coding differences. Also, like, if I, if I can change, like, the word between to among, like, if I take, you know, I, I take, like, a sample of, you know, a million uh, phage and, like, a, you know, a tiny little bit of seawater, right? Easy, right? There's, there's some sort of, mm -hmm. Do we have some sense of what the differences are going to be among that set? Well, people certainly have done sequencing studies of phage and seawater. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, I mean, I don't happen to know what the results are, but those, are, those results aren't known, are known. What we don't know is why, what accounts for the differences. Or a any, uh, uh, million people, right? Uh, or I yep. only have a thousand, right? Uh, to well, there are tens of thousands already. Okay, yeah. okay, cool. So if I want to talk about how all of them will relate to each other, not just pairwise, but... Uh, like you know, the full set. What distribution of differences will have? Do That's we, all. It's do, all do there. What, what is? Well, I mean that that November's graph that I showed you shows that, for example, within Europe, you get increasing difference between individuals as you increase geographic distance. So That's like the them. first two principal components. First two principal components. That is, you can take a person's genotype and locate them on a graph within. 50 miles of, I mean, at least for people who haven't moved around a lot. But usually you do it with grandparents because mobility was a lot less in that generation. I mean, but do we, 
that's that's like you know that's a very uh, restricted view of like the full diversity, right? So the first two principal components. Do we know what like? Is there is there would there be some cool other ways of looking at the data? Maybe I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. <laughs> But it, I think it's a bigger challenge to account for why the differences are what they are. What was so okay. special about um, the chromosomes in the salivary glands of Drosophila? They, I mean, is Chuck here? Is he? Yeah. Yeah, you tell him. Um, well, as, I, as I, let me just preface that with saying one thing. One thing that Monty didn't put on his slide that you should realize that the first half of the of that century of population genetics after synthesis, the structure of DNA was not known. You know, inherit, the material, actual inherited material wasn't known. So these people were doing population genetics of genes for which there was no concept. It was widely debated what a gene was, mm -hmm. let alone whether what an allele was. Anyway, so the salivary glands, it just turned, as Monty said, it just turned out that in certain tissues of some insects, and there are a few other organisms, if the cell is not going to divide any longer, the chromosomes are just replicated many, many times, which makes giant, they're called giant salivary gland chromosomes, and other organisms that have similar thing. And those made those accessible to actual genotyping. Whereas up until the advent of electrophoresis, there essentially was no meaningful source of genetic variation in natural populations other than continuous variation that could be easily studied. Uh, probably, I should preface that saying, a lot of people worked, in, including the early Drosophilus and those mutants that showed, because of Muller's Nobel Prize, they worked on the frequency of recessive lethals. Those were widely studied. And those definitely fit the mutation selection balance model quite well. And they, they, they do to this day. And, and in fact, you can estimate how big the population size is from the distribution of these recessive lethals. Anyway, so. So, but since then, yeah. in Drosophila, forget yeah. the other organisms. Yeah. In Drosophila, have other ha, has have these uh, chromosomes been also visualized in other organs, or is it just other also, organs? Yeah, other oh, organs well, of Drosophila. In other organs, or other no, tissues of the Drosophila. Well, in the salivary gland, it turns out that the, the it's called polytendization, mm -hmm. the replication of the chromosome. In the in the salivary glands, it's essentially the whole gene space, the continuous what's called the euchromatin is over-replicated. In other tissues where there has to be a lot of gene expression that are different, that are terminal, that are not going to divide, there's polytonization of part of the genome. Okay. And that makes for a messy cytology. And so people do that molecularly rather than visually. These were quite beautiful. And, uh, and uh, they, they, they had a very, uh, they, they have a very, the reason that Shansky studied them so long, in my view, is the aesthetics. They're quite beautiful, especially if you Learn on them. I think we should take a break for 25 minutes. Uh, maybe we should thank Mark again.